you know, living in the Bay Area, we're tough customers. What we want is economic development, and we want quality of life. So that means good jobs, strong trade, new businesses, but it also means clean air, clean water, and robust ecosystems. So uh, because we're tough customers, we look to our public agencies to help us get through that. So we look for them to help us with smart implementation of regulations. We look to them, uh, as we heard about the CORE's budget, to spend our public money as best they can, despite the fact maybe not getting as much as we'd like them to get. So our, our esteemed panelists today will give us some insight on their thoughts of how they balance the need for economic development and the quality of life through a strong ecosystem. So to start, we have Brian Baird. Come on up, Brian. Good morning. I'm Brian Baird. I'm Assistant Secretary for Ocean and Coastal Policy for the California Natural Resources Agency. Our job is to manage and protect California's uh, uh, natural resources and to promote sustainable economies and, and communities like you have here in the Bay Area. My job is specific to uh, ocean and coastal resources, and uh, somehow I've had this job through uh, three, now four administrations, 18 years at the uh, California Natural Resources Agency. I want to start out with what's at, at stake. Um, I've, I've been dealing with this stuff a long time, and I felt that economics was always key. So um, we've had two studies done by the, the uh, National Ocean Economic Project. In 2006, we found that $46 billion was pumped into the state economy through ocean-dependent industry. Uh, the lion's share of that, or a lot, quite a lot of it, actually, is recreation and tourism, but also the second factor is port development, port activities, and so forth. So the, the ports are very, very important. In, in general, our economy depends on healthy, envi healthy environment, tourism and recreation, fisheries and wildlife, coastal infrastructure, and uh, uh, things like shipping. Our ports ser serve as the gateway to the Pacific Rim, and I'll tell you, when I was in American Samoa, at one point they talked about a week where they had difficulty getting any uh, supplies, and that was during a strike a few years back, and it was just amazingly telling to me how interconnected all of this stuff was. But our world-famous beaches are international attractions, and our maritime resources are stressed, certainly, but remain spectacular. Our ocean resources and the economy they support benefit not only California, but significantly to the national and international economies. So, in short, my, my thesis when I, when I talk about this sort of thing is I, I believe an investment in the management and protection of our ocean and coastal resources is an investment in both our environment and our economy. And this is certainly the case, I think, in, in San Francisco, in this Bay Area, where we have a mix of natural resources, agriculture, industry, and res residential uses, all of which <clears throat> benefit and depend upon this mix of environmental and economic values. Uh, I, I enjoyed uh, Jay's comments uh, a little bit ago, uh, someone from the industry basically saying, well, you have to have hoops here in California, you have things that you have to do, but it's a quality product that we produce. I, I love this Got California thing that he came up with. And, and, and congratulations to everybody here on, on getting America's Cup. They're coming here for a reason, because it's a fantastic place, and you've all played a role in, in making it that fantastic place. So for the Natural Resources Agency, we, Secretary has, has uh, input in kind of three areas. Throughout the state, what we, do, we do here in the state with our 26 boards, commissions, departments, and, and, uh, and so forth. And then uh, when we look at, uh, well, and also the fact that he is the uh, chair of the Ocean Protection Council. John Garamendi, who you're going to hear uh, from uh, in a, a little bit, was a member of that Ocean Protection Council. But that Ocean Protection Council is trying to set forth big picture thinking. We've put out a resolution on uh, climate change to try to provide guidance on, on where we're coming from. The second role is regional. Uh, I serve as the uh, governor's lead on the West Coast Governor's Agreement on Ocean Health. And uh, this was started by originally Governor Schwarzenegger, Governor Kulangoski, and Governor Gregoire, but now Governor Brown and Governor Kitzhopper from Oregon have uh, come on onto the, the playing field. And the idea is to improve our management and our resources along the entire west coast of California. All this stuff is interrelated ecologically and, and economically, therefore the governors are commonly speaking now with one voice. And a key priority of that uh, effort is to foster sustainable economic development in coastal communities. Finally, is the national role. Um, I was uh, nominated by all three governors to represent the West Coast on the advisory council. It's called the Governance Coordination Council, uh, or a committee, rather, for the National Ocean Council. 
Uh, and in fact, at one o'clock today, I'm on a, a two-hour phone call with the 18 other national representatives throughout the nation on that. Uh, but it kind of emphasizes the fact that we have a role at the state, in the region, and, and nationally. Um, we're only doing five minutes here. I wanted to just kind of stimulate your thoughts and, and interests with a couple of, uh, of I ideas that I think relate to the state, the regional, and the national audiences. Um, fact is, we're all trying to do more uh, with less money. We are in a, in a bit of a decline. We have to be more creative. Well, one thing that, that hit me, and, and uh, one of the conference calls we had, uh, the dredging issue came up, and the dredging issue is significant. And uh, yesterday I was talking to Geraldine Natz, who's on this national committee with me, and Geraldine Natz from the Port of Los Angeles. And we talked about the Harbor Maintenance Fund. And uh, it, it's, it's always great when I do something like this and I actually learn something in order to prepare for uh, what I'm going to say. I've always known dredging was an issue, but uh, California ports, according to the data she gave me, uh, provide 28.6% of the revenues for this fund, that according to the information I had, only 6.6% comes back to California. So, so perhaps when you're thinking about conclusions and take-home messages from this, this conference, maybe one of them is making a, a clear point, as I think has been made, Maybe a little bit more of that money you send to Washington should come back and help with these deepening projects and, and with uh, commerce. And also a related point which has been brought up, which I had here as well, is, is dealing with the Corps. I, I co-chair a, 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 a sediment panel with the Corps of Engineers. They're taking a big hit in the budget. We all ought to try to support the Corps and, and, and keep them on the playing field with us. Uh, efficiency and uh, effectiveness. Partnerships we've heard today are, are important. The Joint Policy Committee makes a lot of sense to me. It's the Air Quality uh, Agency, the Coastal Management Agency, the Transportation Agency, the Association, Regional Association of Governments, to address the economic and environmental concerns that you have within this region. It's the kind of regional collaboration that just makes sense. And I think it's a, a great forum to be talking about climate change in, in, a, in a reasonable and rational way that looks at the environmental problems we have and it looks at it in the context of our economy and other things we have to deal with. Um, I don't know if this is uh, how all, all folks view this, but I've, I've always been a fan of the long-term uh, management strategy, which I think there was a situation where uh, it seemed to me there was some gridlock going on, and this was an opportunity to bring the federal and the state agencies and other stakeholders together to make things happen. And I, I live next to the Hamilton Project, and I'm watching that thing happen, which was kind of a dream many years ago that uh, seems to be, uh, be happening. Uh, finally, and just another example, as I said, I co-chair the Coastal Sediment Management Work Group. We're, we're doing regional plans up and down the, the entire coastline on how we might do a better job in, in managing sediments. We are uh, engaged very recently in, in uh, another regional study that's here in San Francisco Bay. Hopefully that'll provide some additional information and, and direction. So those are just a, a few of the ideas. I'm told to keep this short, throw a few ideas out, and then hopefully we'll have a robust discussion this morning. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I am Will Travis, the Executive Director of BCDC, and I think it would be a good idea to try to start off by putting the theme of this conference, jobs, 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 into the context of our regional economy and the way it really works. Uh, as you heard from Lewis Stewart this morning, we have a knowledge-based economy here in the Bay Area. It uses ideas, innovation, and inspiration to make products and services that we sell to the rest of the world. And to make our economy hum, we have to convince the best and brightest people to live and work in our region. And here's how we do this. We tell a prospective employee, we want you to work here, but we're not going to pay you any more than you get anywhere else in the country. Our housing prices are the highest in the nation. Traffic congestion is terrible. Our public schools are mediocre. But it's a terrific place to live. And it is. It is a terrific place to live because our climate is wonderful. We've protected our bay and open spaces. We've got a fabulous system of parks. We're socially and politically tolerant. We've got ethnic, artistic, and culinary diversity of the highest quality, and we have great universities and cultural institutions. Now, clearly, we have to work on providing more housing that's affordable to all increasing mobility to and through our region and investing more in public education. 
but we should not think about undermining the one component of our regional strategy that is actually working remarkably well. And that's a system we have in place to protect our natural resources. Now, there's obviously always room for improvement in how we operate this natural resource protection system. The way we try to do this at BCDC is to always remember that the most important word in the name of the agency, San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission, is and. We provide environmental protection, but not at the expense of regional prosperity. We support economic development, but not at the cost of environmental degradation. We're responsible for balancing conservation and development, and we strive to achieve both objectives in everything we do. Now, the Bay Area can be proud of having proven to the world that environmental protection and economic development do not have to be at odds with each other. After all, San Francisco Bay is the most urbanized estuary in the United States of America, and we also host the nation's largest coastal wetland restoration project outside the Everglades. As we look at the challenges our region will face in the future and how we can foster regional collaboration to deal with these challenges, I want you to draw your attention to this statement by Ray Bradbury. Someone asked him in his role as a science fiction writer whether he was trying to predict the future. His answer is, I do not want to predict predict the future, I want to prevent it. The map on the right there shows you the areas around San Francisco Bay that are vulnerable to flooding from global sea level rise over the next century. Within that 332 square miles of shoreline land are $60 billion worth of major highways, rail lines, airports, businesses and the homes of over 270,000 people. This map doesn't show the future we are predicting. It shows the future we're trying to prevent. Climate change is going to bring us other impacts beyond sea level rise. We'll have more extreme heat days and lower air quality. We'll have both too much water from floods and too little water during droughts. Warmer temperatures will increase the risk of wildfires and strain the capacity of our energy system to provide enough electricity to keep us cool. To deal with these challenges, we need a regional, comprehensive regional strategy that integrates the initiatives we have underway to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions with measures to adapt to the impacts of climate change that we can't avoid. The author, Mark Hertzgard, describes this two-pronged effort as avoiding the unmanageable and managing the unavoidable. We have a government in structure in place to advance this strategy. It's called the Joint Policy Committee. It's made up of four regional agencies, the Association of Bay Area Governments, the Bay Area Quality Management District, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, and BCDC. And as the first step in developing our regional strategy, we're working in partnership with 110 local governments on a sustainable community strategy to meet the mandates of SB 375 and reduce our need to drive everywhere, including to this ill-advised location for a meeting, <laughs> by planning more compact mixed-use development around transit. The second step in this process, integrating our regional greenhouse gas emission efforts with climate change adaptation is not a job for government alone. So under the banner of One Bay Area, we're reaching out to business community, investors, insurers, and research institutions. Economic prosperity in the Bay Area involves more than creating jobs in the short run. In the long run, it is creating a sustainable economy. Our economic well-being won't be assured unless we build it on a foundation that is resilient to the impacts of climate change. Dealing with climate change is as much an economic necessity as it is an environmental imperative. The Bay Area is in competition with the rest of the world to attract investment capital to our region. 
international capital will flow to those places that have recognized the reality of climate change and are taking concrete steps to both reduce and adapt to its impacts. On the other hand, insurers are already abandoning places where the risks are too high. Other regions around the nation and around the world are already developing strategies for dealing with climate change. Rotterdam, which is already the largest port in Europe, dreams of becoming Europe's Silicon Valley by climate-proofing the entire city within 10 years. Well, we already have the world Silicon Valley here. We can't afford to lose it either to Europe or to sea level rise. To win this battle, we can't ignore the threats posed by climate change and sea level rise simply because the problems are too difficult or economic times are hard. The future is what can happen to us while we're doing something else. This is the future we have to prevent but it will be our future unless we begin planning now for the future that we want. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Tori DeCiro. I'm with the Corps of Engineers San Francisco District. We have a regulatory oversight of the district from Klamath Falls in Oregon down to about Presidio of Monterey on the coastal side. In my district, that, that was my district boundary. I'm a part of the South Pacific Division. We have four districts in the division, mine, Sacramento, um, LA, and Albuquerque. So with that, kind of gives you a flavor of what we do. I'm on a two-year assignment here. This is the first time on regulatory and civil works. So I'm one year through this assignment. My replacement's named and he will be here next summer. So it's a quick turnaround of uh, commanders that learn civil works, that learn the regulatory community. So when I first got here, the Bay Planning Coalition sat me down and said, probably within the two months, what are your goals to do here? I had no idea. I, you know, you learn, but about at the, for, at the year in, you start to get your legs and understand it, then they rename your replacement. So it kind of blows the wind out of your sails. But with that, um, I'll talk a little about regulatory and I'll talk a little bit more about what's going on in the, in the district and division. Uh, somebody asked about the division. We have an interim commander, Colonel Bill Leedy. He'll be here at lunch. He is an interim commander. There'll be a new change of command if Congress approves the Brigadier General list and that change of command will be June 3rd at Sausalito if you are so inclined to go see the uh, South Pacific Division command, change of command. Oh. I'll start out by introducing the Chief of Regulatory, Jane Hicks. She's over here. Uh, other core employees that are in the room, if you could stand up and introduce yourself and your job real quick. Jessica? She is the uh, navigation lead, so she's trying to coordinate interim navigation lead, but it is for this uh, dredging cycle. Dave? Okay. And Peter Lasavita, he's the uh, art, not economist, environmental biologist. There we go. All right. So, regardless of the political direction that Congress will kind of throw the core in, uh, to me, I've never voted. I don't care what the Congress does. They can cut the core to half, they can double the size of the core. I salute and drive on and I execute. So if the core gets cut in half, as the guy that comes in for two years, we start looking internally, okay, what are we going to lose for jobs and what are we going to gain for jobs? We've got to keep the employees happy, got to keep the employees uh, busy and find work. So that may be overseas deployments, TDY. Uh, traditionally, San Francisco district, we're a very civil works heavy district. We have been tied to earmarks. We've had a lot of political power in California. No longer the case, it seems, right now. And so the Corps of Engineers has put out work plans where the Corps decides, okay, who are the projects that are going to get money and who are the projects that aren't. So it pretty much comes down to who's shovel ready, 
who has the regulatory permits on board, and then the Corps says, let's look at the benefit-cost ratio, and we'll fund those first. You don't have your Corps permit ready, or you don't have your other permits or agency things to be shovel ready, you're not getting funds this year. So we see work plans this year, and I imagine it'll be work plans next year, because I don't see Congress figuring it out how to do a budget. If Congresswoman Pelosi says, I want X money to go to here, there's the whole Tea Party that says, I don't think so. I don't see why Illinois has to fund uh, a California issue. So it's all up to the core, and the core goes by what is shovel ready at the time. So that's a little bit about the funding on everything but regulatory. So let's talk about regulatory. On the regulatory side, we're pretty steady state. The funds have been kind of constant throughout the years. Uh, no, no big changes on her budget, on Jane's budget. So she's got the same amount of people. Uh, doesn't grow with inflation, but it's pretty flat, but not declining like a lot of the other things. So what does that mean to me? Well, we've heard from California and regional leadership, and I say they're leaders. They make policy. They guide the region. I am not a leader when it comes to the regulatory uh, decision-making process. I'm a manager. I'm a manager that follows congressional law and the 404 Clean Water Act as uh, given by leaders at Washington, D.C. So I can't change the law, but I can say, hey, Jane, are we doing this right? It's not, are we doing the right things that a leader would do? Are we doing things right? Are we doing things effective? Are we getting the permits out quickly? Are we talking to industry on saying, hey, you're missing this, you're missing that, trying to help you get the process quicker? So we do have some issues that I've learned over the years with consults. We do meet our metrics for grabbing the permit and getting it out an answer or getting a consult out. So we do meet our internal metrics. Where we start dropping the ball is when we have to consult with other agencies, Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, other federal agencies. It kind of gets lost. I don't own them. They get sent over there, and it may not come back quickly. So my, I guess my bottom line is I will engage those agencies if the public comes on board and says, hey, We've had this permit out, permit application out for a year. We haven't heard anything back. This is the reason we need it quickly. We're about to lose jobs. I'm about to lose a maintenance cycle. Can you go fish it out from Dick Butler or Fish and Wildlife Service and say, this is why it's important, and I will do that favor. And every time I do that, usually I get a quick response going, okay, we'll move it up to the quick, faster and get you an answer better or quicker. So. Again, as a manager, I'm willing to do that. I won't shortcut any of the Clean Water Act or 404 stuff, but again, the goal is to be efficient and move out with the processes and give you an answer on where things are failing. Some of the uh, other speakers have talked about collaboration is the key. 100% agree. Um, won't go into the details on LTMS, but every time I sit down with LTMS and we bring industry in, uh, I always wonder where we're going to go with it, and I'm kind of walking out of those meetings going, wow, good talking points, good things to consider when we talk with industry. Anytime I sit down with NOAA or Fish and Wildlife Service, always learn new things. So anything you can do, Bay Planning Coalition can do, to bring those opportunities to come together and learn from each other, I think it's great. This is a great one here, but probably a smaller opportunity where we kind of focus on some of the uh, tighter issues at hand, maybe maintenance of uh, canals, I don't know. So those are the issues I think that collaboration is key and I could help with at the federal level. Uh, other examples we've kind of run through uh, on where things kind of get lost, I'll give you Humboldt Harbor. I had the harbor master go, you know, we put a permit in to get this new pier up at Humboldt. Uh, it wasn't a new pier, they were just trying to re replace the planks. And so they gave it to the Corps and Jane, and Jane sent it out for consult, and one of the consult agencies goes, okay, you want to replace the planks? Tell us how you're going to keep the ballast water at bay on the ships, how you're going to keep the invasive species out of the ships, and uh, 
just gave a whole litany of lists of things to do on just to replace the upper planks on a pier. And I was like, you know, that's kind of like bringing my Ford Expedition into the shop and having the mechanic go, we need to talk about why you have that Ford Expedition to replace the spark plugs. I think you really need to go into a Prius. You know, <laughs> not exactly what I need from the mechanic when I just want to do maintenance, maintenance on something. So I'll close with that. Again, my ideas, more interaction. I really learn a lot. Again, the commander only has two years. He catches it probably at the first year, and that's about when they name the replacement. So quarterly collaboration with industry, quarterly collaboration with uh, other federal, federal agencies. Put the public interest review factors on there real quickly to talk about, again, district commanders bring it all together. Needs and welfare of the people, um, recreation, I think economics, number two. So again, it's not all about looking at one, uh, one portion of the Clean Water Act. It's a collaborative of 21 things. We're neither for or against the project. We just kind of say, what's the best interest for the, uh, for the United States? Thanks. Good morning, my name is Chris Yates. I'm with NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service. My job is to oversee uh, four offices uh, throughout the state of California that implement the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Those offices are up in Arcata, our Northern California office, in the Central Valley in Sacramento, down in Southern California in Long Beach, and uh, dealing with bay issues, our Santa Rosa office, uh, North Central Coast office um, up in Santa Rosa. So what I want to do uh, a little bit today is I, I had some notes um, and uh, through the discussions this morning and some of the things said, said I'd like to, uh, to kind of weave my comments around some of those in, in, the, uh, in the short time. We are supposed to identify our, our, oper our objectives and our challenges and ideas for collaboration. So the objectives that um, me and my organization and our staff are seeking is to basically be the guardians of those species in which we are entrusted uh, by the American people to protect. Uh, for NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service, those are the salmonid species, steelhead, salmon, uh, marine mammals, sea turtles, abalone, and green sturgeon. And with that responsibility, um, to um, also consider and uh, be as efficient and as productive as we can in promoting economic development and ensuring that the um, communities and the users of those resources um, are treated in an efficient and fair manner while we're protecting those species. Um, my slide, I think the thunder was stolen a little bit by Brian in his opening remarks. Uh, the, the theme of this conference is jobs. Um, abundant marine resources equals jobs. Um, and the balance is um, often between competing uh, industries and competing uh, perspectives on where uh, the priority for those jobs should be. And that's often what I'm dealing with uh, throughout the state of California. Um, particularly with the salmonid species, um, the regulatory, our regulatory sphere covers almost everything that happens by people in California. If they touch water, um, that is an area where salmon, pers where, where salmon are or their critical habitat is designated. That includes all of the water industry, the diversions, the state and federal water projects, um, up and down the coast and inland. It involves transportation, every road, uh, every uh, bridge crossing that's redone, building of piers, building of bridges. Um, from universities who are looking for uh, take compliance to private industries who are seeking habitat conservation plans, we run the gamut across the state. And so our challenge is, um, just to summarize, kind of consist of a couple things. Uh, the first and, and foremost on the mind of what my responsibility is, is the status of those species. Uh, many of those species are doing very, very poorly. Um, take, for example, uh, Central Coast Coho, uh, which Dick Butler at our Santa Rosa office is principally responsible for, which are the folks that many of you deal with. We had plus or minus 200 fish return this year. Um, that is a, a species that is on the brink of extinction. Um, and so um, the other thing that, that we're dealing with is with that scope of responsibilities that we have 
and the many types of stakeholders and regulatory um, agencies that we deal with is the limited resources we have to address them. And um, that is something uh, when I look ahead and we're talking about some of the budget issues and challenges that concerns me greatly because as resources decline potentially for our agency, that's fewer and fewer people to deal with what's hopefully an increase in stakeholder and business activity in the state of California and the need for more permits and more regulatory compliance. Um, and that's a, that's a bad juncture between decreasing capacity on our end to process the regulatory work and the hopefully increasing um, activity which, which stimulates that, that need for regulatory compliance. So that's a couple of the risks that I wanted to, wanted to identify. Um, in the rest of my few minutes, I, I kind of wanted to, um, to jump into Jay's remarks, which I thought were, um, I think they were characterized as provocative, and I, I would say that they were, um, I wouldn't characterize them that way. I think that's a very um, important dialogue to engage in, is the management of risk. Um, and um, I truly, I don't know Jay, I know our staff work very closely with ADR on their permitting process, um, but I, I do want to say, um, offer it, another perspective, which is our job as resource managers um, is all about managing risk. What we do every day is managing risk. And um, what I think a, a key point for discussion is, is where, where does that intersection of risk meet? Because that's the point that we're all looking for. Um, my staff gather information they assess what those activities are going to do, and they try to analyze and predict what those activities are going to do and how they're going to impact the species. That's risk management. The same as private businesses are trying to manage risk, um, get through the, the, the maze of, of regulatory permitting and compliance in order to be able to do their business, produce a product, uh, produce jobs, make money, and um, improve the communities where they exist. So, in my mind, the, you know, the real conversation is looking for that juncture of risk management. Um, and it takes a, an understanding from both sides that we're both managing risk. Um, in, in getting back to, to Jay's example of, of their permitting process, and this is similar with all, one of the most um, time-consuming delays or pieces of that process is, is ensuring that the type of information that we need to assess that risk is available and almost always that is one of the principal delays and frustrations on the part of applicants and other agencies like the core are the information needs. Um, that was a huge part of the, of the time it took for the regulatory compliance from our perspective on, on ADR's um, project. So one of my ideas for future collaboration is to um, develop a more local regional forum for developing transparently those information needs. Um, so that uh, future projects such as ADRs um, come to the table with a, a more clear understanding from my office run by Dick Butler in Santa Rosa of what those information needs would be and some of the best management practices that have been found through previous projects that have been used to minimize that risk. Um, so as I mentioned, we're all about managing risk. We have to manage risk to ensure that it's not jeopardizing the future existence of the species. Businesses have to manage risk to make sure that they can get through what they need to get through in order to actually run a business. And so um, I'll leave you with the idea that um, from my perspective, the, the looking for that sweet spot um, is exactly where we need to be in terms of managing risk, developing more transparency and understanding of what the information needs. Um, I will rebut a little bit in terms of Jay's what I think is unfair um, characterization of of a government uh, bureaucrat, of which I am one. Um, I'm a regulator, that's what my job is. Um, and I think, um, as uh, just speaking uh, of, of my organization as own, people do not um, get rewarded or promoted um, because they don't take risks. Um, people get rewarded and promoted if they are able to find that risk intersection of the risks to the species, of which every new project that comes to us is a potential new and increased risk to a species that's already in a very bad state. Um, they get rewarded when they can find that juncture between managing the risk of the species 
and promoting the projects of which many of you in the room are most interested in, in promoting. And so um, that's what Dick Butler gets um, recognized for. That's where, when he can find the solution to um, ADR's permit application, um, adequately protect the species, but get it done as efficiently as possible and, and get the permit out the door so they can do their business. That's where you get rewarded, at least in my organization. So I'll welcome any comments on that and thank you for inviting me here. Thank you very much. My name is Scott Warner with AMEC Geomatrix uh, and I'll help us get through the next section of questions and answers. Do you want to make sure that uh, Mark Ross did not, with the uh, Air District, did not, did not make it? Okay. So let's get going. Um, and I'd like to thank Chris to start with because I think that's a great segue and you should probably be up here moderating um, with that. One of the, if you, if you look at the program, one of the things that we want to try and do is have this panel of speakers uh, provide a response to the first set of panelists and we actually got that started. Uh, we will, we will function pretty similar to what we did this morning, where there are a number of pads of papers on your tables. Uh, Amanda and, and the other staff will collect those and we'll bring those forward and Lou and I will go through those and we'll provide those to our, we already have some started, the, the, uh, the pads that uh, Ellen has. But I'd like to start with a, an opening question while you're getting your remarks down and passing those forward, which is a, a segue somewhat to Chris's segue from Jay's comment earlier. Uh, we are in a different economic period these last couple of years than we were the previous couple of years. And one of the things that we've asked the panelists to consider in putting their remarks together is, has there been any change in how they function as an agency considering the economic aspects that, have, that we are we're going through right now? I think we all can agree, or at least we can discuss, that a, a strong economy actually begets a strong environmental program because of the tax base and the revenue and there's more support for doing that. So one of our themes here about growing jobs and growing the economy is also twofold to then help to strengthen and balance this economic vitality that we're talking about. So my opening question, and Chris and the other panelists maybe start that, what have you instructed your staff or what have you talked to your staff about that kind of helps them understand where that intersection is between promoting the strong economy we need, the pro projects going forward, and maintaining and strengthening the regulatory aspects that we still appreciate here, but we want to make sure don't stop our, our programs. Anything new during this period compared to previous periods that you've talked with your staff about? And I'll let any, we have uh, microphones here and Lieutenant Colonel can start. Yeah, I'll start out, I mean it goes back to find inefficiencies and Jane and I have talked about like the Humboldt County one you know I talked to Jane about that and she goes well normally when we get comments from other agencies that are kind of off in left field that we think we just send it back to the applicant because it would interfere with our independence or neutrality of the of the uh, of the permit application I'm like you can't do that you got to be you can still maintain your neutrality of a permit, but when you get things out from left field, you've got to challenge some of the, some of the other consult agencies on why do you need that information. I mean, you can still maintain your neutrality, but when you get additional information requests from left field that you think are from left field, because you're probably the expert on it more than the permit application, challenge it a little bit. And so she's working on that especially in this environment. Um, another example and is Willits Bypass, probably our most, one of our most controversial permit applications we have, uh, 80 acres of wetlands. Uh, Caltrans sends it out, basically gives a textbook high-level story of we want the uh, permits application, we want the permits, but here's none of the details, but this is what we're going to do once you give us the permit. And we had to say, no, you got to give us the details so we can give it to the public. Oh, by the way, since it's a $2 billion project, we did assign our lead uh, regulate or wetland specialist to walk parcel by parcel with Caltrans and say, this is what you could get for each parcel. 
of functional uplift or functional assessment. So we did work with the public agency or other agencies to say, I'm not telling you how to do it, but in our math, this is what you would get credit for. So when there's $2, billion or $2 million at stake in all those jobs, yeah, we will sit down with applicants and guide them along a little bit more than, than other methods. I guess the, the way I'd respond to your question is that, um, just so folks know, I, mean, we, we are, I and all of my staff are very acutely aware of the economic situation in the state of California and throughout the country. Um, we are aware of it every single day from um, our own communities to the inquiries we get from uh, elected uh, officials, both at the local, state, and federal levels, um, to all of the stakeholders and, and applicants that we deal with. Um, the, the way I would like to view our role is that, um, and what we are mandated to do by law, is based upon the best available science. And that's how we are making our, our decision making processes um, are conducted. And we should be seeking the most efficient um, way to, uh, to proceed with our mandate of protecting the species, whether it be good times or bad. Um, the economy is important whether the economy is doing poorly or doing well. And our, our staff, I think, pride ourselves on trying to do the most efficient job we can to ensure the responsibilities that we've been entrusted with. And um, that's based upon the best available science. Um, and that should be the, the modus operandi that we pursue, whether it's good times or bad. And so I, I, we are acutely aware of it, but it doesn't actually change the specific way that we go about doing our, our business because we should be doing that all the time. Well, I, first off, I can't help but comment on the irony that last year's conference was all about climate change and now that the science on climate change apparently has been either verified or disputed depending on what part of the country you're in. The United States is the only country in the, United, in the world where climate change is a political issue. Um, but now, now that the economy is recovering, the theme of the conference is jobs, jobs, jobs. I can't wait to find out what the theme's going to be next year. Um, we haven't changed at BCDC. What we have done is we've embraced a, a, an attitude for the past 15 years, which is that for the most part, the people who apply for a permit from BCDC fall into one of three categories. They're either a business that has to be on the waterfront. They're a port, they're a marina, they're uh, a refinery that uses ocean, open ocean shipping. Uh, or it's somebody that loves San Francisco Bay and wants to live on the waterfront. They want their boat, they want their view. Or it's one of the many businesses that finds that there's a distinct competitive advantage if you're on the waterfront. You can sell a mediocre dinner for a lot more money in a waterfront restaurant than you can for one inland. Whatever the three categories they're in, they want to protect the bay as much as we want to protect the bay. So our staff views permit applicants not as the enemy, not that somebody we're, who's trying to get a project through our regulatory process and our job is to deny it, but rather as somebody who's trying to save the bay as much as we're trying to save the bay. And what we try to do is listen to them. And when they say, look, here's what I want to do, and we say, here's a standard condition we found that works to do that, and they say, it didn't work for me. What we found is if we craft the permit by listening to them and what their objectives are, what their risk that they're trying to manage, and we explain what our risk is that we're trying to manage, we end up then not with a permittee, but with a partner. And once we issue the permit, we are no longer a regulatory agency. We're a partner. We've, that permit has been issued not because we didn't want to issue it, but because it is in full compliance with the law and by damned we should be helping them to succeed. And in doing so, what we find is they end up with a permit, and, and you're, you know this, if a government agency says, here's what you got to do and here's how you're going to do it, you look at it and say, how can I find a way around that and still meet the letter of it but not achieve the goal? 
On the other hand, if a government agency comes to you and says, here's what we want to achieve, can you help us achieve it? And you say, well, yeah, but let's do it in a somewhat different fashion. They buy in, our regulatory, our, our permittees buy into the process. And they come back sometimes and they say, you know what, the way we thought it was going to work doesn't work. We need to change the condition. So we look at change the condition. So we're looking always at the objective. So the, the regulated community is not an enemy. They are a potential partner. And once we issue the permit, we are a partner in that project. Uh, just a quick comment. I mean, you know, what I do working for the Office of the Secretary is, is, is larger scale questions. I mean, we're looking at, at issues with the Delta. We're looking at issues with the Marine Life Protection Act or we're establishing networks of marine protected areas up and down the state. Uh, the Marine Life Management Act, we're trying to restore fisheries populations up and down the state. And I think we're maintaining those processes. Uh, uh, this isn't directly to the regulatory question, but we're doing that. And a lot of the reason uh, that we're able to do that is with our public private partnerships, which um, Marine Life Protection Act, for example, would never have uh, taken a step forward without the kind of public-private partnerships that we've been able to deal with. That said, um, I think we're in for a, 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 you know, a, a challenging road here with this uh, upcoming budget. If, if we have the budget that does not include any kind of a, uh, you know, a, a sustaining the tax measures and so forth, we're going to see some real challenges with our state parks and with our fire services and, and with other sorts of things. And, I think it's pretty hard uh, for me to say we're going to be able to provide the same level of service that we provided before there. I think it, this is going to be a real, a real challenge. Um, uh, I'm pleased with things like our Ocean Protection Council. We, again, through public-private partnerships and through some uh, bond measures, we still have enough money to, to do some innovative uh, kinds of projects with market-based fisheries and other sorts of things that we think could actually lessen the, the uh, I mean, come up with, with better uh, options in the future. And we've set up a science uh, group, uh, the uh, Ocean Science Trust, who are advising us on all of these sorts of processes. Hopefully, we can find better ways to do to do business. But you know, I think we're all in, in the business of trying to do do more with less and trying to be more efficient. And I spend my life uh, taking uh, 15 inputs and trying to consolidate it into five things we can talk about and figure out how to uh, accomplish. I deal with a lot of people who do the exact opposite, so it's um, <laughs> it's a challenge sometimes. Great, thank you. So I've had a couple of um, questions that have come up, and the themes are somewhat similar. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with this for right now. So once a project is defined, there are two, two concepts that seem to continue to define that project. Duration, to get it permitted and get it done, and then the cost of doing it. So we're going to focus on that for a little bit right here. Uh, one of the questions has to do with sea level rise. So it's a good segue from a year ago where we were talking about that and, and the cost of that and who will pay for it. And there's good and bad in that. One is that there is money that has to go into the protection schemes once those are defined. And there's the cost or actually the money that will go to the various private and public sectors who will implement those, those remedies. So uh, this question, and, and I think it's fair to ask both both CRAV and the, uh, the Army Corps and, and other agencies, because everybody is involved. What is the cost of that protection? I'm not saying about the cost of not doing it, although you can answer that way, because I know that will be part of it. But what is the cost of doing that? How do we pay for that? Well, I think the, the first thing in calculating the cost, we have to recognize that there's a great deal of uncertainty as to how much sea level rise we're planning for over what period of time. So the approach that we've suggested be used, and this comes from the Ocean Protection Council and the advice that they've given us, is if you look at the trajectories of sea level rise, they stay pretty tightly together through about mid-century. So they're on the order of 12 to 19 inches or so. So in your planning, you can figure out with that much sea level rise, what is the risk and how high do you need to provide the protective devices? And you can calculate that cost in. As you get beyond that, then they, the trajectory spread way out. So what we think is the best approach is it would be silly to pay for something you don't need, and it would be equal, equally silly to not anticipate that you might need that. So to incorporate a, an adaptation strategy in 
to your planning. So you say, I don't know how high it's going to get, but if it gets this high, here's what I'm going to do about it. And if it gets this high, here's what I'm going to do about it. And I've reserved the space, and I've provided the capital or a way of capturing that capital. Now, the, the challenge is, as you say, who's going to pay for it? And the game that we play traditionally in the United States is if you're a homeowner and your house is along the Mississippi River today and it gets flooded today, as is happening, you expect your local government to help you out, and the local government tries to push the cost to the state, and the state tries to push it to the feds. But the problem we have right now is that everybody's pushing back, and that revenue isn't there. So one of the things we think we have to do in the region is figure out what it is going to cost to protect everything that we want to protect, and then figure out how we generate the money. Because it, we can't rely on the traditional mechanisms that we've had in the past. Now, some of the schemes that have been advanced are, we heard about the Salt Works project, and whatever you think about that, they have internalized the cost of flood protection. So much so that they would protect not only their project, but they would protect low-lying areas in Redwood City that you and I or other taxpayers are going to have to protect if that project isn't built. Uh, similarly with the project for Treasure Island. They have an internal financial mechanism. So I think it's going to depend on a case-by-case -case basis, but we're going to be looking at the projects to not load that cost on the public. And from the public side, we're going to have to look at how much it's going to cost to protect everything that's there now and how we'll pay for it. I'll ask a question. Do we consider sea level rise in our regulatory permit application? No, we don't. That's what I thought. So we don't. The federal government does not look at that at all when we come to a regulatory application. But when we look at an investment to a flood control project, yes, we are required to look at sea level rise in accordance with the Coastal Zone Management Act. We look at the three curves and sit down with the non-federal sponsor, such as Santa Clara Valley Water District, and say, what are we protecting? Are we protecting a power plant, sewer, po sewer plant, uh, Silicon Valley? What's the risk if uh, the curve is high? So we jointly make the decision. We want to go with the highest curve, and then we jointly cost share 75% uh, federal government and 25% from the local sponsor to pay for that increased flood protection on the jointly agreed to curve of which sea level rise scenario we're going to go with. Great. Thank you. Um, I'd like to continue on. Unless there's another comment by Brian or Chris, this might be something that Chris, for example, might want to answer. And it has to do with, as I started before, duration of getting a project done. So we talked in our earlier session today, we talked about needing to keep the, the channels dredged, to keep the port active, to keep going like that. But oftentimes, these projects do take a lot of time. Yes, there's a lot of technical issues. There's a lot of regulatory issues that have to go forth. One of the comments that we had or questions from the audience was about if a project takes so long to get done, to get it permitted and to get, to get it in, we may lose our advantage of that project, right? So a question is, how do we stay competitive with other states or other regions who are also vying for that project and make sure that we get the, the right uh, regulatory treatment, but we don't go overboard so that we lose that advantage of that project? I guess the answer I'd give is kind of what I alluded to in my in my points earlier. I think the where that where that efficiency happens is the relationships on a more local regional level, um, and those relationships building an understanding uh, and transparency of the information needs, what types of impacts the regulatory agency such as us are concerned about, um, and ways that we have mitigated or um, required changes to pass similar projects. Um, there's a lot to be learned from those three things um, that we all can do a better job on. We can do a better job of trying to work with partners to make that more transparent. The um, intermediate um, agent, regulatory agencies such as the core and other folks that we work with and the affected industries and partners um, coming to um, that discussion in advance of the urgent um, permit application 
with insufficient information is, is the way to solve that problem from my perspective. Um, if we wait until the urgent permit application with insufficient information, um, then the turnaround time of us asking for the information, people figuring out how to get it, um, going through that, figuring out how do we mitigate or, or address those concerns, that's what takes, that's what always takes the most time. So um, going back to my proposal of what we could do here in the Bay from, with uh, the local partners and uh, our offices would be to somehow uh, build a different forum to, to make those things more transparent, um, more predictable um, so that that application can be as efficient and as speedy as possible. Uh, two responses to that. One is we have a provision in our law that we have to process a permit within 90 days. And if we don't get it done in 90 days, it's approved without condition. I think that sort of discipline across regulatory agencies, maybe not 90 days, but a pre prescribed period of time, this is how long you have to do the job. And if you can't get it done, it's done for you. The other thing is you're going to be hearing about the America's Cup later today. Uh, they are providing funding to BCDC and to other regulatory agencies to expedite their review and processing. Uh, we have a similar relationship with Caltrans. It's one of those things we learn from the private sector. If you want to get mail or FedEx someplace faster, if you're willing to pay more, you can get it there faster or you can send it by snail mail. And having uh, an opportunity for somebody to step in and say, my project is important, I've got a short time deadline, I know you guys are short staffed, we'll provide the resources so that you can assign priority consideration to this and move it through quickly. I think the combination of those two things, a discipline within the agencies and a way of expediting through the market process. Right. Um, and just a comment, uh, maybe a little dated, but um, I used to work a lot on offshore oil and gas projects. and. Um, the NEPA CEQA analysis was a, a great thing for attorneys because it was almost guaranteed litigation on those documents. And I think one of the best processes that, that we used was a thing called the Joint Review Panel process. Um, because let's face it, back in those days, uh, the Coastal Commission and the Department of the Interior and the Minerals Management Service were not exactly on the same uh, you know, plane half the time. So uh, what ended up happening is we would write these documents through this Joint Review Panel process where the, uh, the Minerals Management Service, the Coastal Commission, the State Lands Commission, and the, the instance of this particular oil development, uh, two counties got together and basically met uh, once every two weeks as this document was being, being written, asked a lot of hard questions. By the time the document was done, all of those agencies and staffs knew the thing backwards and forwards and were uh, completely signed off on it. And it, that was one of the last times we had a successful lawsuit on one of these documents. So I think it actually got done a little faster it, it uh, was, was a much stronger process. Um, I'd say the downside to it was it's very staff intensive. Uh, you know, I mean, we're doing a lot of traveling, and um, of course that was paid for by the applicant, so the, the, the financial part of it was covered. So, just, just to respond to the two ideas that Will threw out there, um, on the on the mandatory timelines, for example, under the Endangered Species Act, we have guidelines for how long a Section Seven consultation should take. Um, however, that the consultation doesn't start until we have the necessary information. So um, implementing something like a, just a standard timeline, I believe, would lead us to say no much more often than we would want to or need to because the lack of information to allow us to assess that risk and come to a determination that the project can proceed. Um, so I, I, I don't know that I support that, um, that concept. The, the second one about the reimbursable agreements is a, is a key point. Um, we um, have various reimbursable agreements with other agencies or um, entities to ensure that when the stack, uh, the queue is this tall, uh, we have specific biologists that are paid for through reimbursable agreements that um, focus on um, the environmental compliance and permitting process for those agencies or those processes. And we have it throughout the gamut, Caltrans to high-speed rail to um, different agencies to private entities. And that basically assures that when that project comes in, there is someone dedicated to doing it, and that's their top priority. Um, and it won't go in the queue 25 things down. So that's, a, that's also a consideration in looking forward to potentially significantly reduced resources and the queue growing as our number of staff decrease. That's always an option for um, industries to consider. Great. Thanks. 
Um, before we start getting, we're going to be sure that we're done at 12.15 so we can get into our lunch program uh, and make sure we have our speakers all set up for that. I want to ask if anyone in the audience would like to, who hasn't had a chance to uh, provide a question on paper, would like to ask a question. In the front here we have, front table. So since I am speaking on behalf of the communities, I want to say that I'm glad that Mr. Yates is here. I feel like there's more consciousness there than there is on the other side. Um, case in point, um, I myself fought for a pro against the project in San Leandro where we had wetlands and the Army Corps of Engineers approved it. And it's supposed to be an eco park initially in the plans. Right now we have just a concrete land. It's all concrete. So we took away the opportunity of, of doing something better there. Uh, we fought you, we tried, and we failed because you were more political than you were a part of the community. So that never leaves my thoughts. Uh, when I see uh, from many uh, acres to less than an acre of wetlands left. So I'm concerned about those species that used to be there and they're no longer there. I'm concerned about the fact that the Port of Oakland, it, Oakland Airport specifically, is planning to use some of the wetlands, um, which was next to where, what we lost. Um, so I, I, I'm really disenchanted with the permitting process when you say um, we have 90 days, and if we don't do it by 90 days, it's approved. What is that doing for the fence line communities that live next to those areas? And how is that changing the wildlife that we need to have in our areas? It's, it's really a concern for us. So some of these laws I feel like have failed us. And how do we change that so it doesn't fail us in the future, considering the fact that today we are all being challenged with funding. Uh, I would like you to think about the fence line communities that are losing and the species that we are losing along our coast. And I'd like you to answer, how are you gonna change the process so it doesn't fail the, our land and our people? Would you like to go down the line? <laughs> who, who wants to go first? Good question. Thank, thank you very much for the question. Good question. I'm not exactly sure what the, which pro project it is, but I'm sure Jane will look into it. But our Clean Water Act specifically says no net loss of wetlands. That doesn't mean no loss of this certain area of wetlands. We have uh, mitigation bank credits where people can uh, build a, a mitigation wetland bank in another area. Um, and we try to make sure it's in the same habitat uh, uniformity code. So if Oakland or Bay Area wetlands are destroyed, it's not, oh, we're taking a mitigation bank credit in New York City. Uh, that's not the case. It tries to be another mitigation somewhere in the Bay Area. So again, we're not no, no, no loss of wetlands, we're no net loss. So I'm not exactly sure we can talk more afterwards on that specific project. Yeah, without, without, I'm not familiar with that specific project either, and I'm not sure whether it was one that NOAA Fisheries was involved in, whether it was uh, salmon habitat or, or not. I guess the, um, we're, the, we're operating under different statutes and different, uh, different regulatory environments. The, under the Endangered Species Act, there's um, uh, the designation of critical habitat, which is habitat that's deemed to be essential for the survival and recovery of the species. Um, and so um, if there is impacts to that habitat, then we are consulted with and uh, determined that whatever project is occurring is not ad adversely affecting it. So um, I'd be happy to follow up on that specific project as well, but I'm not familiar with it. Let me just comment on that 
the statement generally. Um, <clears throat> Brian and I have an old friend who used to be in Congress, Gary Studs, and um, he was holding oversight hearings on the Federal Coastal Zone Management Act, and the, the issue was what is the appropriate level of government to be making decisions on coastal management? Should it be done at the local level, the state level, or the federal level? And they went around the country, and he said after listening to everybody, his conclusion was that the appropriate level of government to make any particular decision is that level of government which will give you the answer you want. And I'm sure that you're totally dissatisfied with the regulatory system because you don't like the decision that came out of it. I expect that the applicant is totally dissatisfied with it because it took too long to get through it. Uh, those of us who are administering the system and find that here are the rules that either the legislature or Congress has set out for us, and we're following those rules, we're doing it in a timely fashion, and we've issued the permit or not issued the permit, we're satisfied with it. But I think that it is important to recognize that just because you don't like a decision doesn't mean that the system didn't work. It just didn't give you the answer you wanted. It's really hard to comment on this, not knowing the, the project. And these things are complex. Uh, they're little pocket wetlands. And I think, as the Corps was, was basically saying, that oftentimes uh, there are projects that are allowed in those areas, and they're mitigated by offsite areas that are far more productive for the, for the region. And I think that's the concept. I don't know what, what the circumstances were here. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's very, very difficult. And I think what Travis is talking about is they're not, he's not talking about reducing his level of review. He's talking about giving a time certain where they're going to focus and they're trying to get the job done. And, and so I, I, I don't know. I guess that's my thought on it. Luke? Okay, so we're uh, wrapping up. And as we did in the first session, uh, we wanted to look at one thing that we could all do to work together uh, to, to meet both those needs and, and, and that 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 crossover point between uh, the public interest as it relates to jobs and the economy and, and uh, making sure that the Bay Area remains that vibrant place that we've all come to learn to love. And uh, we've heard lots of strong arguments of where those things are, but if you can give us one thing that we can take back and work on, um, what would that be? And uh, we'll start with you, Brian, since you have a microphone. <laughs> Um, I, I think, you know, I mean, what I do for a living pretty much is try to bring disparate groups together to try to come up with pra practical ways of solving problems. And I, I think these, these uh, operations where we bring people together, what you're doing here in the Bay Area, I, I was pretty much involved with bringing the three governors together, California, Oregon, and Washington, to look at a more logical way of looking at that whole area. And now I'm, I'm part of the Governance Coordination Committee advising the National Ocean Council and how, as a community, we can begin to shape a national ocean policy. So I, I'm just a real advocate for processes where we bring people together, try to, try to not look at 500 things, try to look at 10 things that we can do and, and make some progress. So, and I think you're doing a lot of that here in the Bay, and uh, I think that, that's, that's good to see. Um, I, I think as we are looking at the political situation we're facing both in California and nationally right now, there is this sense that um, you have elected officials from both parties who are running on the platform of lower taxes and less government, and nobody's running on the third part, which is, and the lousy services that this brings you. A recognition that if you want these services, you're going to have to pay for them. Uh, Jerry Brown was speaking couple weeks ago, and he said well, the surveys that they've done found that most people believe that waste, fraud, and abuse costs about 40 percent of the budget. So if we could just get rid of waste, fraud, and in fact, the entire department of waste, fraud, and abuse would be abolished, <laughs> that you could save 40 percent of the money. And of course, it's just not there. But a, a a public recognition that if you want government to work, it's like buying an automobile and then going into the shop and saying, my Ford doesn't work, and the guy says, the gas tank is empty. Of course it doesn't work. Oh, I didn't realize I had to pay for gas. This is the price of democracy. I'd just like to reiterate, it doesn't take a lobbyist to reach out if you have issues to me. My, 
web address is on the email. Um, I think I've had three people reach out and say, these are the issues going on with my permit. It's been taking too long. Can you please help? Uh, each, all three of them were spot on. It's like, my God, let's see if we can fix it. So don't be afraid to reach out if it, it's not making the common sense test. So reach out. I think I've said it a couple times, and I'll just reiterate. I think uh, taking this discussion from more of the abstract to the practical, uh, my suggestion would be for BPC to host a meeting, uh, including Dick Butler and our, our Santa Rosa staff, the Army Corps, a few key stakeholders who perhaps have gone through the regulatory process, um, keep it small, um, and with the goal objective is to create some sort of a transparency document of information needs and lessons learned so that that benefits um, all of the existing businesses and future businesses uh, to try to not change the standards but make those standards more transparent and more efficient process. And that's great to end on an action item. So with that, I'd like to thank all of our panelists this morning.